The COVID-19 pandemic has taken a heavy toll on our healthcare teams, with many suffering from stress, trauma, burnout, and increased behavioral health challenges. When physicians, nurses, and healthcare professionals experience extended periods of stress and burnout, they often feel as though they're letting down their patients, their families, and their colleagues. The impact of these prolonged stressors has amplified the need for support and efforts to improve well-being, destigmatizing mental health. Join us to learn how Edward Elmhurst Health's Employee Mental Health Committee works with members across different disciplines and backgrounds to identify and implement strategies to address employee mental health challenges. Welcome to Advancing Health, a podcast from the American Hospital Association. I'm Tom Hederly with AHA Communications. In this podcast, Rebecca Chickie, Senior Director of Behavioral Health Services at the AHA, speaks with Gina Sharp, President and CEO, and Lindsay Harrington, Manager of Psychology and Counseling, with North Shore Edward Elmhurst Health in Illinois. At Edward Elmhurst Health, Employee mental health and well-being is interwoven into its recruitment and retention strategies. Earning platinum recognition from Mental Health America's Bell Seal for Workplace Mental Health, EEH serves as a best practice example for how to support employee mental health and promote resiliency. In today's podcast, Ms. Sharp and Dr. Harrington will describe their work to make employees feel safe, included, and supported while building organizational resiliency. They'll share how they use employee feedback on workplace experiences and concerns to provide cutting-edge and empirically supported education and trainings on mental health and workplace violence. Hello, this is Rebecca Chickie, as Tom said, and it is my honor to be here with Gina and Lindsay. I'm going to jump right in on this conversation because they are the true experts in this topic. So please don't let me get in their way of sharing their wonderful experience and expertise. So I'm going to start with the why. Why did you start on your journey to try to factor resilience into workforce recruitment and retention? And Gina, I'll give it to you and then you and Lindsay can engage. Great. Thank you, Rebecca. That's a fantastic question because... Workplace resilience is a critical component to all organizations. We are successful in treating our community and the health of our community with our employees. And so the more we could engage our employees and help them be more mentally resilient, physically healthier, and collaborating with one another to address those ailments keeps them on a track of really being able to sustain, come to work, and care for the patients who we're serving in our communities. Lindsay, anything you'd like to add? You know, I think that we know that when our staff are well, then they are able to do the best care for our community. And knowing that our staff is going to be really healthy is going to give them the opportunity to give the best care to those in our community. So let me, I want to pull that out a little bit more. I can see how building in resilience really could help in terms of retention, because as an employee myself, when I feel that the place that I work, and I do, supports me and really pays attention to my needs as a whole person, that builds loyalty, it builds passion around the work that you're doing. So I've got that. But in terms of the recruitment aspect, are there elements that you look for in the questions or, or this is what I was wondering, is it also, and, and perhaps this is the idea, you are an employer of choice because you do provide and support the whole person of your employees. So Gina, to you. Having a program in place for attracting and retaining new employees that focuses on resiliency, mental well-being, physical well-being, provides an opportunity for individuals to want to apply and be a part of an organization because they know you're going to take care of them as a whole individual. 
and knowing that you're going to be able to support them when they're feeling good, support them when they're not feeling good, and then help th- helping them to advance in their career within the organization. And retention is so important for organizations, especially as we're seeing the number of individuals retiring and leaving the workforce. And this younger generation, they're, they're looking for organizations that are going to cater to their needs and be more thoughtful and insightful on how they want to live their lives and balance work in their personal lives. And they're different generationally. And so having programs that can attract individuals of all ages, no matter where they're at in their career journey, is really important. And what somebody in their 20s needs might be different than somebody who is in their 60s and still working for you. And so being able to tailor that with different programs that offer insights into managing your mental well-being, managing maybe some of your complicated health issues that might be going on with your work, somebody who's focused on helping you lose weight so that you could lead a healthier life, focusing on preventions, going for a hike, going for a walk, gathering with friends is really important. And so this is an opportunity for us to really differentiate us as a workforce of choice in the ability to attract new people to want to come and work with us. And our goal will be to have a waiting list of individuals wanting to come and work at our new organization and and be there to be a part of this team and take care of our community. You're almost meeting, wanting me to apply. So <laughs> We're you, hired. I have You're a hired. job for you. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay, you want to um, yeah. add on? You know, I think that it's wonderful that we have the, a comprehensive wellness program. Um, it allows us to address the needs, like Gino was saying, at every stage of an individual's life. So there are supportive resources in place for those who are in their, you know, young 20s, as well as those who are getting ready to kind of think about retirement and, you know, where they're going to go as they, you know, are wrapping up their career. And so having the ability to address not just physical health and, and mental health well-being, but also to think about financial financial health. Well-being is a really important kind of factor of our wellness program. We know that working in healthcare is stressful. Um, It's a naturally stressful environment and it's a naturally stressful job. And for some of us, that's kind of why we got into it is the excitement of kind of living in this fast-paced, you know, high need intensity in organization. And the helpers need help too. And so having this wellness, you know, initiatives and the things that we do to pay attention to the mental health and well-being of our employees allows people to be supported in a way that they need so that they can continue to do that wonderful, you know, impactful work that they're doing without the risk of them having that burnout under that stress. So now you've convinced me. I understand, you know, why you went on this journey, but tell me, this can't be easier. Everybody would be doing it. So where did you start with this work and who was involved? If somebody was listening and they were like, okay, now I want to go do this, you know, share with them maybe just three or four steps. You know, how did you get this going and who did you tap in your organization to be involved? Great question. And we certainly have many different committees in place that started us along this journey. And One of the very first ones that we formed was the Wellness Committee. And the Wellness Committee really identified three key critical areas that we needed to focus on as an organization. Physical well-being, mental well-being, and financial well-being. And from there, we identified different subcommittees that needed to be put into place to really help support our employees and moving towards this journey of employee well-being, encompassing all those three areas. And so as a part of this infrastructure, we then identified a wellness champion. We identified, and by the way, that is a, a wellness officer, chief wellness officer that we identified. And then we also looked at who needs to be a part of this. It wasn't any one discipline, right? We had individuals from human resources, from marketing, from line staff, right? We have some nurses on there. We have our CNOs on there. We have our behavioral health team on there. And really looking at 
how do we look at this from many different lenses to really implement and push forward these initiatives? And so each subgroup really then identified what were key drivers impacting the health of our employees and what would make the biggest driver of change to improve the lives of our employees. From there, communicating and marketing this to your staff so that they know the different services are available was really important. And so one of our subcommittees, and Lindsay and I were talking about this earlier, was really important for us to have a communications committee. It sounds easy, right? You put these programs in place and you are like, yes, we're there, we've got it. But it needs constant attention. Whether it is, and it needs attention through different modems. So you can't just always put it out as an email blast. You can't just put it on your internet site. You have to be able to look at it and address it from multiple different angles to really get the word out there and be available to our staff. You know, I think our, our having that communications committee was so vital because it allowed us to have a clear, seamless communication of what we were doing and making sure that it was presented kind of effectively through all those different channels and making sure that people were able to easily access that information in a way that was going to be consumable. And I hope nobody quotes me, although now I'm going on record as saying this, but it's always been my understanding that people that go into healthcare often put, don't put themselves first. They put the patients first. They put their team first. And so even beginning to change the mindset that I also need to take care of myself is a very important shift that just through your communications, the multiple communications channels that it sounds like you've put in place, gets that message in a way that people can really absorb it and believe it and participate in it. So with all this, you know, the elements that you've described here, how is this financially sustainable or what was the business case for, um, you know, implementing this? Well, first, can I have Lindsay comment on healthcare workers taking care of themselves? Because that's a huge issue because they're so always focused on taking care of patients that they sometimes forget about themselves. And Lindsay has some great insight on that. Yeah, we use the metaphor all the time of when you're going on an airplane trip. And at the beginning, they're, you know, teaching you about how to buckle in. But they talk to you about when those air masks drop down and that you have to put your air mask on first, because if you don't put on your air mask, you're not going to be able to save anybody around you. And so I, we use that, you know, metaphor a lot with our, our hospital staff and just reminding them, like, you have to take care of yourself and that if you aren't able to take care of yourself, how are you going to be able to take care of everybody else? And that's hard. It's really hard for them because it's not in their natural nature. Their natural nature is always to be altruistic and to take care of other people and to make sure that they're prioritizing other people's well-being. For a lot of people, that's their passion. It's their core values is to be there for others. Frontline responders are the ones who are rushing in when everyone else is rushing out. And so it it goes very counterintuitive uh, to what their natural need is. So that's a lot of our work is helping people to give themselves permission to take that time for themselves and to recognize the importance of taking care of themselves. So many times I would tell staff, you know, the most important tool in this hospital is you. You know, I'm here as a psychologist and I can't do the work. Like, I, you can put me in a room with all the medical tools and I can't do it. And you wouldn't use, you know, a ineffective tool to go do that surgery and you wouldn't use an IV that had been like laying out for days and had been used multiple times like that'd be gross like you wouldn't do that to your patients so you have to give the best tools the you know the sharpest tool the most efficient tools to your patients and the one that matters the most is you Um, so you have to take care of yourselves and that that I think helped them because they were like yes like I'm a tool and I'm important and that helped them to reshift of I have to take care of myself which, you know, is really important. So that's interesting. I'll I'll tie it back to the earlier question about financial viability. And because if you have healthy staff who are using the best tools, then 
more than likely you see an increase in better outcomes, patient satisfaction, perhaps even staff satisfaction, because they're proud of the fact that they're also taking care of themselves. So that begs the question of how can you not invest in a program? When you look at the number of employees uh, that are leaving your organization, the turnover rate, the first year turnover rate, it costs organizations tremendous amount of money to bring on new people, train them, get them acclimated to the environment, learn the organization. And if you can invest in people in their whole well-being so that they stay and they have less time off work, or when they do need it, you're there to support them. There is such financial benefit for the organization overall. And then you continue to have that historical knowledge of an organization through a, a large base of employees who've been committed and loyal to the organization. So my response to that is how can you not financially invest in this when we're looking at individuals who take care of so many people and they themselves need to be taken care of at times as well. Wow. So we've talked about the why, the where, the business case, the fact that it's remiss if you don't consider highly investing in your own staff and supporting their whole well-being. So given all of that, I'm still, because I know there's going to be some skeptics out there and they're going to be like saying, so given all that, what did you see or do you still see as some of the biggest barriers in standing up a program like this? You know, I think one of the things we've talked about is just changing that culture and, you know, giving staff that permission to take care of themselves. It's hard. Um, you know, we, we always joke about, you know, we could always use more time in the day. And it's a high-paced environment. And so asking somebody to take 10 minutes to take care of themselves Sometimes, you know, and so many times I would have heard people say, I don't have that time. And yet that time to take that five minutes is going to help them be so much more productive in those other areas of their life. And um, so I think, you know, part of it is getting that, you know, that permission, you know, that it's okay for me to step away. It's okay for me to take care of myself, you know, sharpen my tools. But then also what we learned was really making sure we got the buy-in and the trust of the staff. That confidence in having staff say, I can trust you with my mental health. I can trust you with my challenges. I can trust you with what I'm struggling with. And I know that it's not going to hurt me or be punitive to tell you these things, but that it's actually going to give me relief, that I don't have to hold this on my own, that taking, you know, a moment, you know, to pause, to reflect, to, you know, grieve, you know, after a tough case is going to allow me to come back better and stronger and that it's going to help me connect to resources that are in our organization, not stigmatized, but promoted that will help me be a better person, not just a better employee, but a, a better mother, a better friend, a better partner. That's a really important piece, but it takes trust. And so I remember, you know, the first couple of days, just, you know, my job when I went in was to say, get people to know my name, you know, get people to know my name and not scatter, you know, when I came into the room. And that trust was so meaningful because then people were able to share with you not only the challenges and the times when they were struggling, but they also got to share with you all the times that they were really happy and they were successful. And I got engaged. I'm going to ask my girlfriend, you know, to move in with me. You know, I won this new award and, you know, my patient went home. And, and so you got to have, um, you know, that relationship with people where you could be there to cheer them on in the moments of success, but also be able to be there with them when they were struggling and really needing support. Yeah, I would also say that when we implemented employee support coordinators, individuals who are there on the units helping with the mental well-being for our, our staff, it's also supporting them, giving them the tools they need because they're there working with staff who are suffering. And so they're taking in a lot of hard negative information. And so making sure that we're supporting the people who are also supporting our staff because it's a lot of information to to take in. And I would I would probably take that even one step further is 
is our managers. Our managers are working with employees every day, and they are in the brunt of, you know, doing not just the day-to-day operations, but then also leading the teams. And so they often get caught in this crossfire of having to manage what the, you know, system is trying to achieve and also manage all the needs of our employees. And so being able to provide the support to to the managers as well so that they know how to have conversations and address issues, concerns, day-to-day things that may come up for their employees is also, I think, very instrumental to the success. This is so great. I hate to start wrapping up, but I am going to combine two questions that we had earlier um, discussed, and I'm going to shift from the negative to the positive. And that is, as listeners are walking away from this podcast and they're thinking, okay, now I've listened to that. That was very inspiring. Can you give them either three things, and they might be one and the same, three things that are success factors or three things that you would like to leave them with if they're thinking about doing something like this in their own organization? Great. I'll give my three and then turn it over to Lindsay. So I think the one of the first things that needs to happen is really establishing a system-wide committee with an executive sponsor, somebody who is a champion for the committee and can help navigate any issues that might come up or if there's needs of hiring additional staff or other types of resources, they're there to help speak to it at a system level with other executives to get behind and promote those different initiatives as well. If you're an organization and you have multiple committees, because that is kind of how we started, it's really important to have clear goals and objectives for each of those committees so that you're not stepping on each other's feet and that you can work collaboratively together and you're not duplicating efforts. So having charters in place is really important to really help make sure that you stay on track with what you need to achieve. And then the last for me is um, what I had mentioned earlier is about being able to communicate it to staff. Out of sight, out of mind. If they don't hear about it, they don't know about it, and then they don't access the services. And so making sure that you have multiple different ways to be able to communicate it to staff is really important so that they use, they use the services that you're creating for them. I would definitely echo that. You know, I think communication is such a, a key, you know, part of that, especially because it does really take an army um, to provide support, especially to a larger, you know, organization, making sure that you have the support of all those, you know, different divisions from uh, your physician teams, your, you know, nursing staff and support, your mid-level managers, as well as your your top leaders, your frontline staff, your environmental services, call centers, IT, like everyone is, you know, really, everyone's a person, everyone's going through stuff, so everyone needs this support. So I think just making sure that you're including kind of all of those people and everyone is on the same page. And I think that's one thing that our, our system has done a really good job with is making that pledge. You know, our, our system CEO made um, the One Mind pledge, which is a pledge that mental health is important in our organization and that she speaks about, you know, her experiences with mental health and encourages, you know, discussions about mental health and diversity and equity and inclusion and to make sure that it's normalized um, to get help and to have services, making sure that trainings are readily available, which I think goes to my third point, which is just really making sure that you have that top-down commitment. We would not have been able to do the things that we have done within our system if we did not have the support and the backing of our, our, our CEOs, of our top leaders, our executive teams. And we saw that, like in departments where the leaders were supportive and encouraging and communicating it, their staff were more engaged with those resources and more willing to come and utilize those staff support spaces to take time to come to us because 
their manager would say, hey, go down the hall and I want you to talk to the employee support or I want you to go take a walk before you come back on here. I saw, I saw a director once take a phone from a nurse and she said, you know, it's time for you to take care of yourself. And I, I think I cheered uh, at that <laughs> moment. I was like, yeah, because that is what we need. We need the leaders and, you know, the people who are, you know, our executives to be supportive of well-being. And when that happens, we have permission um, to do it. And it changes the culture in which we go forward. Thank you so much. I, I just want to say one of the things that, that I think you both echoed is that the most, what healthcare workers of all spans, I'm not just talking clinical and non-clinical, leadership to, you know, to across the board, the most important tool is you. And that's the lesson that we've had the luxury of uh, you sharing with us today, and I hope going forward you'll see similar programs that you've described here happening all across the nation. So thank you so much. Thank you, Rebecca. That would be fantastic, too. Thank you. To learn more about the work being done to support hospitals in improving access to behavioral health services, please visit aha.org slash behavioral health. Development of this product was supported by Cooperative Agreement CK20-2003, funded by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. The contents are solely the responsibility of the authors and do not necessarily represent the official views of CDC or the Department of Health and Human Services.